My name is Vicki Ray, and I'm the coordinator of keyboard studies at the California Institute of the Arts here in Valencia, California. I look for, most of all, I look for a deep, inherent musicality so that if a student comes and maybe they don't have everything all ironed out technically, but they really have something to say, I'm interested in that student because I feel like I can teach people technique, but I can't teach people how to have a soul. So if someone comes in and they're interesting or they think outside the box or they have a particular vision that they're really on fire about spreading and sharing, then I'm drawn to that player. If someone comes in and they have all the technique and chops in the world, but they have nothing to say, I'm, I'm not so interested. I always hung out with composers. A lot of my friends were composers. Um, and then uh, when I was doing my master's degree, uh, I was walking down the hallway one day and my teacher plucked me by the sleeve and she said, I'd like you to meet Dr. Hackbarth. He conducts the new music ensemble and you will be playing in it. And I just went, ah! and I was terrified. And, and, um, and I remember the first piece they assigned me, I had to play 12 against seven. And I just thought, well, this is insane. Nobody can do this. Um, but I got really hooked on it, and um, all the best players in the school were in it, and they were all passionate about it, and I just, I just got hooked. And I love playing music that's just being created, giving the first performance of a new piece, and I love working with living composers. It's so wonderful to, to hear what they actually are trying to say and what they want, and to collaborate with a composer. So it's just, it kind of snowballed after that. But I like the old stuff, too. I think that it's important to do both. If you, if you only play um, modern music and you don't know where it came from, the roots of it, then I think your playing is only going to go so far. And likewise, if you only play old music and you're not learning the music of your time, you're also limited. So I think it's really important to have a balance. So especially with the younger players, the undergraduates, I make sure they have a balanced diet <laughs> in the in the piano food pyramid so they do Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, everything but they also do cage and crumb and I encourage them to commission new pieces from their friends. With the graduate students a lot of them uh, come here specifically to focus on modernism because it's one of the few schools in the country where you can really do that so um, we allow a little more leeway that way if they come here and they really want to focus say on um, the music of of Olivier Messiaen and the French spectralists or something like that. We'll, we'll let them focus on that as much as we think is, is good for them. If we think they have holes in their repertoire that need to be shored up, we might kind of uh, encourage them. But we try to take it on a student-by-student -student basis because I think if you just have one recipe that you slap on everybody, it doesn't work. So they're, each one of them is a completely different set of challenges, and, and that's what makes it fun. There are, every kid who walks in the door is completely different. Their hands are different, and their minds and ears and their hearts. And so I, I try, and I know my colleague also, we try to just have a really flexible, open approach to each student. Your sound develops gradually, just like your personality does. Um, it's very unusual to have a very young player who has a very distinctive sound because they're still developing as a, as a human being. So I think that, um, that as you grow and you get older and you hear more and more music, you become a better listener. You can hear your own playing more. Pianists tend to be re the worst listeners because all your buttons are right there in front of you and all you have to do is just press them down. And they don't listen to themselves. So part of it's just learning how to listen, but also then just um, developing your own ideas of what sounds interesting to you and then finding a way to make it work with your fingers. And that takes a lifetime, you know, we're all still working on that. It has to do with a combination of technical things like how they approach the actual keys themselves, the weight, the, the touch, the parts of their fingers, the kinds of pianos they prefer. Um, Horowitz used a, a really light action that had a very bright sound, so he could play very flat and facile. Other people like heavier actions with deeper sounds, so that has to do with the instrument itself. And then you also get to know people's playing by interpretive um, quirks that they have. People who, like Glenn Gould's Bach, is un unmistakable for its sort of um, 
insane, relentless obsessiveness. Other people's Bach, you can tell because of its lyrical, fluid nature. So it's, I guess, a combination of interpretive things and technical things combined. Do you teach interpretation? Absolutely. I mean, you teach the style as much as you can so that someone's Bach doesn't sound like their Brahms and so their Brahms doesn't sound like their Debussy. Um, so that style, I guess interpretation is also a part of that. Um, but then the challenge is to teach them that without squelching their own innate ideas, to, to be able to work that into the style so that they don't just sound like a cookie cutter replica of whoever their CD is, you know. Sometimes you come in and they, they come into their lesson and you can tell, oh, you've been listening to the, the Murray Pariah recording of that Mozart sonata because you can tell they copied their ideas and that's okay when you're young to, to try things like that out. But I like to try to, to combine their own ideas, their original ideas with the style, particular style of the music too and that's challenging but fun. You, anybody, I suppose, who could read music could sit down and replicate the notes and maybe even go a certain way towards exploring the style of, and the deeper meanings of the pieces. But with every piece of history that you learn, with, with anything that you can add onto the knowledge of a piece, your playing and your interpretation just deepens and deepens and deepens. And that's why you can study a piece of classical music your whole life and never feel like you're done with it because there's always, it's like an onion, you just keep peeling the layers and there's just more and more and more. One of the really uh, amazing things about being a teacher is, is hearing your students 10 years after they've left and, and hearing how, their, how life has changed their playing and getting older, yeah. It's one, it's one of the great things about being a classical musician is that it's cool to get older because <laughs> you get better. Um, I, think, I, I think it's been really damaging to young players. I see my students go out and play an absolutely gorgeous performance that's moving, that touches people, and they walk off stage and they're in tears and they're distraught because they played one or two wrong notes and they have no perspective about the fact that making music is a human art and, and because they're used to hearing these CDs that are perfect. And CDs are, they're little Frankensteins, you know, they're little sewn together bits of perfection and they don't, they're a strange little museum thing. I, I recently had a, I'm on a piano series and um, our board came to us and they said, we want to release a live recordings of your concerts and to, to help raise money for our organization and, and what do you guys think? And, and I said, yeah, absolutely. And some of the other pianists said, no way. So it depends on how comfortable you are, I guess, with your humanity. <laughs> we strive towards perfection. You always have to strive towards it, but you always have to know, too, that you're never going to reach it. So it's a, it's a paradox. Again, I think that really depends on the student. I mean, with a lot of them, I... One thing I, I feel is that the art of being a pianist in today's society is very different than it used to be. You can't just go out and play solo recitals and make a living. You, you have to be able to do a lot of things. And so, um, especially with my undergrads, but with all my students, I make sure that they have a, an arsenal of skills that they can use when they go out there. They can sight read so that they could go into a movie studio and sight read a soundtrack. Um, that they know how to accompany um, singers and play chamber music so they can play with other people and not just have to be a soloist. That they know how to transpose, how to read a jazz chart, how to play in different styles um, so that whatever opportunity arrives at their doorstep, they can take it and make a living and not end up slinging burgers. And uh, I think that's really an important responsibility that we have as teachers today is to help prepare our students, be the best musicians they can be, but also be able to exist in the real world. Should they be an entrepreneur? I, th I think they need to have those skills. Um, and it's something that I think music schools are just figuring out. They have to learn, they have to be able to teach students what to do when they get out of here. Because it's not like the business world where there's uh, a clear cut ladder that you climb to success. There's, once you get out of music school, a lot of kids talk about facing the void. You know, it's like, well, what do we do now? You know, I remember my mom telling me, oh, just take out an ad in the paper, you know. Mom, no, you don't look for classical pianists in the want ads, you know. Um, so 
you, you do have to know how to promote yourself, how to deal with the recording industry, how to write a resume, how to get press releases, contact agents, and do all those things. And we have a career design class where we're, we're helping prepare our students for that. But it's a relatively new thing, and I think we're, we're, our, our eyes are opening to that. Well, I think I'm an idealist. Um, and the, the way that that affects my entrepreneurialism, or my lack thereof, is that I've always operated under the notion that if you just do your best, and play with com as much honesty and integrity as you can, that good things will come your way. So I've sort of relied on that, and it's worked for me. Really, I've had really a wonderful career and great opportunities, and I've worked really hard. But I think I definitely uh, could be better at self-promotion. But I've just sort of lived in this with this idealism that if I just keep playing well and, and playing honestly, that it'll take care of itself. It's another thing pianists are really bad at. They don't breathe because, you know, they don't have to, you know. And so um, their playing can often sound very stilted and um, it, it doesn't breathe, it doesn't have room, you know. So I'm constantly trying to get my pianist to um, play like singers, think like clarinet players, think like saxophone players. How, you know, we talk about how when a singer has to go from here to here, they, they don't just go. They have to use breath to get up there, and it takes effort, and it takes time. And so when they're playing that kind of melody, to, to let it breathe, to let it have breadth, you know. Because the human voice is the first instrument. It's the instrument we both, we all connect with on the most visceral level. So we're always trying to make the piano, which is really a percussion instrument, sing, which is impossible. So you have to have tricks, like emulating singers. And so that's another reason I try to encourage them to work with other instruments, to, so you we're constantly trying to orchestrate the piano, make it sound like other instruments, you know. It's a great life. It's a hard life. Don't expect to make a lot of money. But most of all, don't let anybody tell you that you can't do it, that you can't follow your vision. Because what you have to say is particular only to you, and it's special, and it's important and, and vital because it's you. So no matter what obstacles you feel that you have in front of you or people saying you can't or you shouldn't or you won't, just stay, keep listening to your vision because, because what you have to say is truly important and don't let anyone take it away from you.